All right, good afternoon all and welcome to this latest district dialogues, which is conversations on race and justice in our city. Um, today, we have Dr. Yeshim Sayin, uh, who is the founding executive director of the DC Policy Center. With over 20 years of public policy experience in the District of Columbia, Dr. Sayin is recognized by policymakers, advocates, and the media as a source of reliable, balanced analyses on the district's economy and demography. Her research includes economic and fiscal policy, urban economic development, housing, and education. We really appreciate your time here. Thank you so much for joining us. And I would like to uh, encourage everyone to take this opportunity to mute yourselves uh, if you are not already. Thank you so much, Mary. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about the work we do at the Policy Center, especially uh, we'll be focusing on um, some of the work we've done on housing. Uh, I hope this, this is an open conversation. Please stop me to ask any questions uh, you may have throughout my presentation. I didn't bring a whole lot. Uh, we did, we've done a lot of work on housing, but I went and reviewed all the work I have done on it over the last six years and chose five charts which in my opinion, when put together, kind of explain to us why we are experiencing what we're experiencing in the district's housing market. And those things are a lack of affordable housing, um, housing segregation, and, and, and that, that leads to wealth segregation, um, and um, the, the impact of land use on our housing stock, and importantly, um, the affordability of rental housing. So those are the five topics I will cover. There's a lot more we have done, but I just want to take these five things because I think collectively they kind of tell us a story. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, I think everyone can see this, right? Okay, so this is my um, topic, housing in these five charts. So here's the first chart I want to talk about. This is a chart of the number of units we have produced per year beginning 1900, all the way to 2000. I divided into sections like up to World War II, where all cities were growing, including the District of Columbia. So that's the first green part. And then after World War II, all the way to the riots, where the city was still growing, you know, it, it, it was experiencing population loss, but household numbers were growing. And then the, the about 40 year period uh, between the riots and sort of like right after the Revitalization Act, and then the last 20 years. Um, throughout between 1900 and 1968, we've had lots of ups and downs, but on average, the city had 2,000 new housing units. This is net new housing. So if you take new construction, subtract from its destruction because some housing was built by, because some other housing was destroyed, you know, taken down. So the, up until the world, uh, up and up until uh, the riots, we produced about two thousand units on average. There were higher, there were lower. And then between two thousand five and uh, between the riots and two thousand five, that number went down to about five hundred. So we had about forty years where nothing really happened. In fact, if you take the rate at which we built housing between two thousand five and two thousand nineteen. And if that kind of building took place in DC, there would be 81,000 more housing in it. So this is just to highlight that some of the affordability issues that we are facing today is tied to lack of supply for a 40, 45 year period. I will stop here and see if there are any questions before I move on to the next chart. All right, let's move on. The second chart. Oh, 
doing the wrong mouth, sorry. Land use. On the left hand side, you have ward three. On the right hand side, you have ward six. Both of them are very heavy in single family homes. Both of them are really valid value places, but the density in ward six is more than twice the density in ward three. And that's the function of land use. And the big difference is Ward 3 has a lot of detached housing, and the land use requires large lots for building housing, and Ward 3 has a lot of row, row homes. So people live close to each other, their yards about, about each other, their doors about each other, but nobody turns to, to Ward 6 and say, oh my God, this place is a dump. Absolutely the opposite. People find a lot of value in Ward 3, and Ward 3, for a you know, for every one single family home that's in Ward 3, there are two of them in Ward 6. So it's home to more people, it's home to more opportunity, it's more inclusive. So the, this is the direct result of land use. And it's very hard for us to think about changing our land use. If you think of DC's land use, um, is that my next chart? No, so I can't go back here. This about 13,000 square miles of district land is set aside for single family homes. That is 20% of the entire land area the district has. It's, but if you take out the land occupied by the federal government, and if you take out land that's not zoned for residential, single family home zoning take 75% of the land that's set aside for residential use. So that makes a big difference in the affordability of the house because it, it doesn't allow us to create a lot of density. And the purpose of these two charts is you don't always need high rises to create density. You can create a lot of density by closely packing homes together. I'll move to the next chart. Oh. Still using the wrong mouse, sorry. This is a map of segregation. On the left, all those white dots are family sized units. Those are housing units that can easily accommodate four or more people. And their annual cost of living in them, either rent or mortgage or owning them, is two and a half times the area median income. So area median income is about $130,000. So these are homes on the left-hand side that can be affordable for households that earn close to $300,000. It's that's on the left. And that, as you can see, mostly neighborhoods west of the Rock Creek Park, um, and then a little bit in, in Capitol Hill area. On the right-hand side, are the housing units that are affordable at 50% of area median income. That is people or households that are earning about $70,000. It's not a too little amount of money, $70,000. And there are maybe 50 units um, that are not east of, uh, east of the Anacostia River. So that is the picture of segregation in DC. Housing values have increased a lot in the District of Columbia, but it turns out that most of that increase in value is not coming from new development. It's actually all of that value growth is capitalizing in new homes. For example, if we just look at houses that are um, built to be owned, condominiums that are in multifamily units and single family homes. Between 2006 and 2018, the district had an increase of about 1,000 new single-family homes. That was a 2% growth in the single-family home stock. And then, um, it's not 23, it was 23,000, sorry, I, I was hurried in putting this together. We added 23,000 new condo units. That was a more than doubling of the condo, uh, uh, condo stock. 
same period, single family home values appreciated by 25 billion, condo stock appreciated by 15 billion. That 25 billion increase, only 1,000 new units, that means that most of the value appreciation is capitalizing into existing homes. So now, the reason why our homes gain value, it's not because we have a nice yard or there's a stainless steel refrigerator in the kitchen. Our homes gain value because the land gains value. And land gains value because there's something nice nearby. It's a good school, it's access to transportation, it's access to high quality retail or job centers. So most of this in capitalization of values in homes is actually a reflection of the public and private investments into those neighborhoods. It's that's something to think about. And my last chart. For this, I just looked at rental housing. There are about 80, 81,000 households in the District of Columbia. And it will be more than that, sorry. Let, let me put it this way. There are 40,000 households in the District of Columbia that are renters. And their income is such that they shouldn't be paying more than $750 in monthly rent. Okay. You know how many units exist that are at that rent? 784. As this chart walks you through different income levels, for example, there are 16,000 households that should not be paying more than $1,000, somewhere between $750 and $1,000, and there are only 5,000 units. Most of them in rent controlled units, but still lighter red, and the darker red is post rent, rent control units, units built after 2000, uh, I'm sorry, units built after uh, 1978. And similarly, when you go to the other end, there are 41,000 renter households that can actually pay a rent of $2,700 or more. Even for them, there isn't enough housing. So when we think about affordability in DC, a lot of the programs focus on rental apartments and rental housing, but rental housing has not been the greatest sort of source of affordability in DC. By the way, I have a similar chart, chart for single, for all housing, not just renter, and it looks pretty much the same. Those are my five, five charts. So, so the point is lack of supply and, and land use restrictions have led to an affordability crisis that has created segregation. Most of the value in housing is actually driven by private and so, uh, public investments. And we haven't really solved the affordable problem, affordability problem even through the rental housing intervention. That's it. And I will share this, these charts with you. I'm going to close this now so I can see you all. Um, Connie Citro asks, what or where are the opportunities to increase the density and affordability of housing in DC? That's a really good question. So I actually looked at this. Um, I, I will see if I can find the charts or I'll send it to you later. So there are a few different types of places where there's opportunity. One is downtown D zones. These, these extend to a lot of places like Nayyad is D-zone, Noma is D-zone, and those are the places where there wasn't really a whole lot of housing, there wasn't really a whole lot of things to start with, so most of our growth in housing has come from Noma, early Noma, and Pan Quarter, right, and then Navy Yard, uh, Mount Vernon Triangle, Southwest Waterfront, and now one opportunity to grow housing is obviously uh, Walter Reed, although it took an incredibly long time to do anything with it. Uh, and then there are opportunities east of the river. I think RFK Stadium is definitely an opportunity. I, if we do end up getting the FBI headquarters, to, that's an opportunity. So there are still some places that we can go to. 
I mean, the district has been for given it is zoning restriction, it's really a successful place in building new housing, but it's all multifamily, it's concentrated in certain parts of the city, it's not very conducive for families to live in. Um, and, and that's it. And then there are actually, for example, I looked at board six. There are places in Ward 6 where housing development is below zoning. But historic district is, 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 your, is, is the reason why he cannot build. So we have these all kinds of layered sort of opposition to construction, which is zoning, historic districts. You know, you have people complaining to the council. We have the mother of all. Uh, uh, Preemptions from the federal government, which is the Heights Act. Um, so yeah, there are lots of challenges, and opportunities too. Do you think that conversion of downtown office space could alleviate anything, or is it not enough? The mayor's goal is fifteen thousand units, I believe. Um, we have about seven projects under. Going, going forward, um, there is some incentives in the mayor budget to support that, although most of the money is outside of the financial plan. To give you an example, Calgary has planned to convert 10 large office buildings into commercial in their downtown area. They are putting $150 million in it. As you know, this year in the District of Columbia, we don't have that kind of money. And we're not going to have it next year or the year after or the year after. I think some incentives will be important to bring conversions from like from happening over 10 years to happening over five years. The trouble is, you know, the most successful example of conversions is Wall Street when Wall Street moved out of Wall Street. After 9-11, you know, all of these companies moved out. If you go to that part of Manhattan to the tip and walk around right now, it's being converted because there were historic buildings. The, you know, the infrastructure was amenable and uh, there were no restrictions about you have to have affordability components, you have to have first source. So like Trump developed them, Bloomberg developed them. I mean, they're a bunch of like super luxury apartment buildings. Um, and I think in the district, there's understandably a focus on affordability, but the more you kind of require things from conversion, the less feasible they're going to get. It's very hard to say something definitive. What I'm hearing is some of the challenges that the district is facing is a, the, the footprints are not particularly uh, amenable because they're too big. You can't have housing in too big buildings because some, like what happens in the middle, you need sunlight. There is one project, Folger Press, I believe 19th and L, they're cutting a courthouse courtyard into the building and you cannot do it for it's all buildings as well i learned so many things about construction that i never really wanted to know but like um there are some buildings where steel cables hold the plates together so you can't cut into them the whole thing will collapse um and so i think conversions are important but we still need to think about sort of a post-pandemic job strategy for the city because without jobs, it's no longer a city, it's a suburb without suburb with tourism. I saw a question. Yeah. Um, Joanna Kendig asked, in the wharf area, there are a lot of new housing built fairly recently, but I believe rents are high. Do we know why? And was any affordable housing required? I'm, it may be that they actually contributed to the Housing Production Trust Fund. This also happened with, with City Center. You know, they have apartments right there about those like super luxury retail areas. And rather than including affordability, they I put some money into the Housing Production Trust Fund. One new development that's really expensive and has affordable for inclusionary zoning requirements is um, Richard Lake. Oh my gosh, uh, I forgot what they're called, but the Fannie Mae conversion in Ward 3. 
usually in most buildings who have inclusionary zoning requirements have a lot of vacancies. That's partly because we don't have a good system of placing tenants in IZ units. But that, that's really actually a tragedy. But I think that particular building, it's IZ units are all filled, 100% occupied. Does anyone else have questions? There is a way to raise your hand if you want by going to more and reactions, raise hand, or you can type something in the chat if you have a question. One question that I had, I noticed the, um, you know, extremely low levels of new construction that you noted between uh, the riots in 2005, which is a pretty long period. Um, was that a specific to DC thing or did that happen in other large urban areas as well? It was very specific to DC. That was a very hard period for the city. It, 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 um, it lo we lost a lot of population. That was largely driven by, you know, not just, so it's important to think about that period as not just the white exodus. A lot of people think of that as white exodus. That's in, in along with the riot, we also had the school desegregation that drove a lot of white families out of, out of large urban places, not just DC. But what, another thing that happened in the District of Columbia, especially starting 80s, is the black exodus. We lost a large number of black families. The reason why Bui is the most affluent black community in the entire country is because people were afraid for their children. There was, it was first the heroin epidemic, then the crack cocaine epidemic. As you know, Marion Barry, with his hiring, has really helped contribute to creating a black middle class in the city. And in my mind, his biggest tragedy is that black middle class abandoned him and went to Waldorf and Prince George's County. Schools weren't good, all of that stuff. So uh, during that period between 1968 and 2005, about that 500 units that we built, a little bit is public housing, actually. Um, Lee Reno, no, Larry Ozan asks, uh, most additional housing in the DC area since World War II has been built in the suburbs. How much do we need to build in DC now? I mean, it's a really good question. I think the way I think about it is the biggest impact of the COVID pandemic on the District of Columbia and cities like us is it really broke the relationship between where people live and where people work. Right. So people talk about I've, I've heard some people talk about commuters as being like, you know, they don't really contribute to the tax base. They come here maybe by lunch and they go back home. I think the better way to think about this, this having a concentration of, of, of employees in the downtown area, it contributed to the strong growth in commercial property taxes, which actually paid a billion dollars into the district's coffers every year. Now that money is dwindling, it also creates, it attracts talent. It's, an, it's a reason for people come to DC to work and maybe they stay for families and stuff like that. Now we really cannot trust the whole lot on employment growth until we kind of understand where the chips will fall with respect to the um, remote work and the office demand. So we're gonna have to build a lot of housing to make the city attractive. I think it will have to be more than that, um, the city, the District of Columbia has been planning for growth since 2005. You know, since Tony was the mayor and, and, and implemented all these changes and, and worked with Alice Sherblin to create a vision. And, um, you know, I think Fanti came in 2006, that was my first year in the DC government. And I had never seen, I worked in the office that did the revenue estimate except for one year, which is the Great Recession, the money just fell from the sky, right? Even the Great Recession, we kind of weathered it okay because we were still attracting new residents with jobs. So our tax income tax base was growing. 
Um, this is the first time in a very long history where the city has to learn not to plan for immediate growth, but current learn to plan for long-term growth. And I think investments in housing are going to play an incredibly important role. But also, how do we think about the issue of crime? How do we think about learning laws at schools? How do we think about um, creating opportunities for middle wage workers in the city? Um, I, I mean, uh, to going back to Larry's question, a lot of this, like, we didn't even think that Loudoun County was a part of the metro area 25, 30 years ago. It was like far out there, but that's where the housing growth has really, you know, so residential construction has moved really to the, not just the suburbs, exurbs. Joanna mentions in the Capitol Hill Historic District, I see a lot of renovations that enlarge the houses into six bedrooms, six baths units, not into flats they are zoned for. I wonder at the motives going into these decisions. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think it's been going on for a while because the schools are so good at the, at the Capitol Hill area. A lot of families have purchased these and then over time, just convert them back into single family homes. So because that's where they want to raise their kids. Interesting uh, way to look at it. I can see that now. So it means they're staying, um, but it's only one family. It's only one family and they want to have kids. And, and you know, they're probably, the thing is I grew up in Istanbul and Ankara and Istanbul, two cities in Turkey. And in Turkey, the only people who live in single family homes are rural people. Like nobody in the city live in single family homes. We all lived in flats. There were big flats. And, and I was really surprised when I moved to the district, this area, to the District of Columbia, and found that a large part of the city looked very suburban. I wouldn't put Ward, Ward 6 into that area, but there are large parts in Ward 4, Ward uh, 3, Ward 2 that look extremely suburban. Mm -hmm. I understand that a lot of people value it. This is, you know, everyone has their taste, tastes and preferences. But the problem with that is it makes cities very expensive. It makes it harder for people who are in most need of opportunity to come and work in cities. Like if you come to DC to work, your lifetime earnings are gonna be much greater than going to, I don't know, Morgantown, West Virginia. Nothing wrong with Morgantown, that's the only the, the, the place that popped in my head. Um, because there are more opportunities here. But if if I am a high school graduate. I think I'm going to have a much easier chance of finding housing in Morgantown, but that means that I will never have the opportunities that I would have in DC. Yeah. Anyone have any other? Here's one. Um, DC government has done a poor job of building and managing housing for lower income residents. How can government increase housing stock for low income people? Thank you so much, Larry. This is a question that we also think about quite a bit in the District of DC Policy Center. One of the strategies that we have to build housing for low-income residents is the Housing Production Trust Fund. Now, it is the it is it would be it's sacrosanct. Nobody can touch it. But let me tell you that it is really not the, not the best way of building housing. That's because the cost of constructing new housing is extremely expensive. It costs about six to seven hundred thousand dollars to build a single unit in Ward Seven or Eight, excluding owners' equity. And people will tell you, "But wait, Yeshen, they these homes have forty-year covenants on them. Isn't that great? They may, but they get refinanced every fifteen years." So it's extremely expensive. We worked on a policy called the inclusionary conversion which essentially take market rate units and turn them into affordable units by buying covenants. And it could not, it doesn't have to be a whole building. You can buy five units in this building, 10 units in this other building. So the DC government would, we estimate that 
to create 15 years of affordability at 80% of area median income in a, in a building next to the zoo, you need $115,000. So compared to production, it's extremely cheap. It's like one fifth of the price. We're actually working with hospitals and healthcare workers to turn this into an entirely privately funded, like a private rent control, if you want to call it. So um, it is challenging, uh, but that I think the short answer is preservation of existing stock is always going to be cheaper. And then the thing is, I mean, we have to build that supply and demand. The only way that we're going to keep housing prices under control is if we build a lot of it. Sonia Conley says, if the goal is to house families, would thinking regionally result in more low-income housing? That's another good question. I think one of the things, one of my favorite people is a man named David Rusk. He was the mayor for Albuquerque for a very long time, and he wrote a book called Cities Without Suburbs. He lives in uh, right next to the cathedral. So when I found his book, book and read it, I immediately wrote him an email, and the next day I showed up in his house um, because I wanted to meet him. And he wrote a book called Cities Without Suburbs, as I said. The purpose, the, the biggest argument in the book is when you look at metropolitan areas, those metropolitan areas that are not administratively fragmented are far better at creating inclusive policies and growing and creating diversity. Our metro area is the opposite of that. We have a lot of fragmentation. We're not as bad as like some places in Ohio where every street is a, you know, some sort of unincorporated government. We're not as bad as that, but um, we are pretty fragmented. So um, there is very little cooperation. People have tried collaboration in the housing market. There have been a number of initiatives, but we really haven't done a very good job at that. COD tries the Council of Governments. There was this one entity, I can't remember its name now, but it was a number of landlords and developers in DC, along with some academicians that tried to do this. Um, before COVID, I could have remembered this, but right now my brain doesn't process words and timelines anymore. Um, but yeah, I think the, the regional aspect is a really good one. Especially in field development, right? I mean, that's what you want in places like the Washington DC metro area. You want infill development. You don't want development taking place all the way in Waldorf or Exerbia. You want it to be happening in Arlington, Alexandria, parts of Fairfax, parts of Bethesda, um, close to the city, on the metro lines. And that's proving to be harder. How about Section 8 vouchers for lower income people? DC government hasn't been doing well with this source either. Yeah, this has been a controversial thing. Um, and I think the, the driving force has been one or two really bad players. A lot of the Section 8 housing vouchers, landlords became fond of Section 8 vouchers during the pandemic because it created a whole lot of stability in their incomes, but our vouchers are limited to what the feds pay for and it will allow us to participate in. And, um, you know, the biggest change that we are experiencing now and we will continue to, to experience, pandemic has been an incredible economic shock to the District of Columbia and its economy and its tax bases. But we really haven't felt it because money has have fallen from the sky the last two years. Mm -hmm. The federal government has put an incredible amount of money into DC government, in the metro, in the schools. And that's meant that in the last two, three years, we have been able to support families that are experiencing hardship and create a lot of programs, right? Our typical year uh, rental assistance has been $8 million. Last year, we were at 42. 
Typically, your contribution to the housing production trust fund is $100 million. Last year, it was half a billion dollars. Uh, all schools now have, you know, tutoring. They have, um, they have uh, mental health support. All of these programs, it is incredibly difficult to come out, go out and say they're not effective. I don't know if they're not effective. If they are effective, I also don't know if they're not effective, but we don't know. But what's going to happen, what started happening is federal money is disappearing. Next year, it's going to completely disappear. The metro itself has $700 million operating deficit that will start in the next fiscal year. I, as someone who kind of feel like I'm educated on these topics, have no idea how they're going to feel it. And, uh, and next year, when the federal money disappears and everything disappears, we are going to have even harder times paying for rent subsidies, to paying for you know housing production trust fund. So we really need to think about think more growth oriented and less preserve it. I mean, it's hard when folks are hurting. Obviously, the, the state and local governments is where the rubber hits the road. You know, I I want to do to do. I went, got my PhD at George Mason University, which is the central hub of like libertarian corporate state for my education. You know, I come from that kind of crazy wing of libertarian world. And I started in DC government in 2006, thinking that I'll work here for a couple of years and I'll move to IMF, you know, this. and then when the great recession hit, I really had to reassess my thoughts about the importance of state and local government in the lives of people. It is extremely important, extremely important. Um, but we're going to have to find a way in investing growth because right now I don't see our economy and tax base changing in a matter of a year. It's going to, it's going to be a slog. Should we eliminate zoning? Janet, I am coming to your house next <laughs> <laughs> to have a cup of coffee. Uh, this is a, my major reaction is yes, but this is a political non-starter. Um, has your office been do they have any opinion on the development at the Macmillan sand filtration site? My personal view, I mean, we're a think tank. Everybody, like, none of the things I say reflect the opinions of my board. Every scholar I work with has a different idea. But our general point of view is that land should be developed for, I mean, housing creates far more opportunities than anything else. So, it should not be left empty, let's put it that way. Any I mean, other? you had more six experienced a lot of growth in your backyard, and it didn't lead to the terrible, terrible outcomes that people were worried it will lead to. And now I think one thing that really bothers me about this is if I were to come to you and say, you know what, with all this development, there are too many black and brown people in my neighborhood. Progressive heads will explode. I will be canceled. Nobody will ever talk to me. And rightly so, rightly so. But if I were to talk about this in the context of this density, it's going to increase traffic and all of those, that stuff. And I'm not saying that people who are worried about this is racist, but I think we really need to pay attention to the, the cost at which these decisions come to us. It comes at the cost of the opportunities for future generations, and none of us are rich enough to own the city in that way. Any other questions out there? Let's see. Nothing in the chat, folks. Now's your time. NIMBYism is everywhere. I attended some public meetings about development for Macmillan. Neighbors wanted their open views. Yeah. I know. And, and wind on their faces. I've heard that too. Yeah. <laughs> that was... Been, yeah, there has been some success 
So we have the examples of Minnesota and Seattle that have taken important steps to allow for uh, duplexes, multiplexes. Arlington recently did this. And each of these places have their own different history of getting there. In Minnesota, that was largely driven by racial equity. People called out on the NIMBYs very loudly saying, these are racist policies. And you need to walk away from them. And that was a long process. In Seattle, the issue was the impact of Amazon that really shook that place because people moved in so quickly and the housing supply could not respond. It was not elastic at all. It was very rigid. And a lot of, I mean, it, it came as a great shock and that led to that. In Arlington, there was a very well-organized EMB movement um, that really delivered it. And that, I, I, the person who did this, his name is Luca. I can't remember his last name, but I can email you, like maybe someone we're talking to to understand like how did Arlington got get to that? It might be an interesting story to listen to. Was this previous development in Arlington or something in the future just, that you were talking recently. about? It just recently okay. happened, yeah. Okay. I live in a single family neighborhood. Building a big apartment building next door would damage my life. Okay. That's from uh, Larry Ozan. Um, you may actually end up meeting a lot of fun people, so there might be some benefits too. That may be it. Um, if there are any other questions, we welcome them. Joanna, if you wanted to say a word uh, from behind uh, the screen. I think um, Ms. Sonia has something to say. Did she? Okay. What? What? Okay. What? Well, I took. That's okay. Say something. Okay, uh, I turned off my mute. This is Joanna. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, so first, my reaction to Larry's uh, comment. I live in single family neighborhood. Uh, big building, a big apartment building would damage my life. I think I would feel very similar, but I don't think I would feel the same negative reaction if uh, a house nearby were turned into two family dwelling rather than being a very large house for maybe two generations, uh, never these days for three generations and uh, families are getting smaller. So I think we need to somehow reach out our neighbors, our communities and remind them that there is a middle ground between uh, up to the height limit apartment buildings next to us and densification uh, by thousand cuts or thousand tiny dwellings. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, that would be doubling of density, which is a big achievement. I think neighborhood history play a role. Uh, Gretchen has a note about the Connecticut Avenue. I'm very familiar with where you're talking about. It's really interesting to walk through these neighborhoods or around, around uh, Florida Avenue and Connecticut. It's a lots of single family homes next to apartment buildings. There are other places in the, like, in the world like Paris where you have density, but it's not like too much. So you can still make different uses. There, there, there are some um, architects and um, land use experts who have been mocking these kinds of plans for different cities all the time. So when you see it on paper, it's not as scary. So it, it looks like it's okay. And I think that's the big thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi, I, I, I'm Gretchen. I'm, I'm new to this discussion. I, I, I agree that um, it, it seems like a good idea to think about um, multiple family housing, not necessarily as huge apartment buildings, but perhaps smaller 
um, clusters. And certainly along Connecticut Avenue, there are apartment buildings that are, most of them are maybe six or seven stories high, but they're all around us. I live on Connecticut Avenue all around us. And, and my apartment building has been there almost a century. And I think that's true, you know, our, our single family dwelling. So I would say along Connecticut Avenue, there's quite a, um, there's quite a, it, it, it's a very normal and productive coexistence that we have. I value walking by the, you know, the lawns and the gardens and the trees that are near me in single family dwellings, but um, our apartment fronts on Connecticut Avenue, so it's kind of behind me. So I don't know, it seems to me that various, um, rather than saying no apartment buildings near single family housing, to think of varieties of ways and to look at examples of ways that apartments and single family dwellings have existed for many years. Francis? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I live in the part of uh, Capitol Hill, East uh, Hill East, where Safeway has come in. Uh, and it has, um, in fact, we've got quite a few apartment buildings now in my neighborhood. Safeway has uh, about 350 apartments. There's another apartment building, the Lockwood. There's another apartment further east um, on 17th Street. I have to say, I like, and, and this is mostly single family homes, but I like having these apartment buildings in my neighborhood. And I walk around the, so for example, in the morning, I'm generally walking up toward the Safeway, it's two blocks away at 8.30 in the morning. And it really brings a density to the neighborhood that I like very much. In fact, I comment to people, oh, this is so city. 15 years ago, when I moved to, um, to Capitol Hill, to Hill East, it, it didn't feel much like a city and now it does. And I think, I feel that it's safer uh, so many people going into those apartments and into the Safeway. So the apartments are above the Safeway, which is terrific for those folks. Um, so I'm I'm one of those people who thinks having an apartment building near single family housing is um, is really nice. And um, and I live in the part of the hill that does have space. We're going to be be getting more of these apartment buildings down on 17th Street. Um, near the metro. So um, I think it's a good thing. I really do. I'm curious about the cost of the, the apartments. Are they rentals or condos? They're all, and they're all rentals. They're all rentals. And a one bedroom at, I just talked to someone who lives in the, the one about above Safeway that's called Beckert's Park. And they're, I think they're expensive. I'm actually thinking myself that I might be moving to an apartment. So I'm interested in the rent. Uh, I think that's two thousand a month for a one bedroom apartment there. Um, and it's you know, it's only about eight hundred square feet. So it's a small apartment. six they're expensive. There's no question you could not have a family in that apartment. I think on the hill we uh, have some condo buildings, some of them conversions from schools, a couple of churches. Uh, I have not looked at the prices of them, but I think cities tend to be expensive. And until we add thousands and thousands of housing units, mm -hmm. we it probably will stay that way. Mm -hmm. Economy, it's, that's what it is, unfortunately. But I think if we advocate for gently increasing density, encouraging accessory dwellings, encouraging alley dwellings in our Capitol Hill neighborhoods and uh, apartment buildings in locations where it makes sense, that is a good path. So let's go to those new development and zoning meetings and all that and uh, see if we can encourage it. Because it also keeps the neighborhoods walkable. Uh, yeah. Sonia uh, Connolly, do you wanna ask your question yeah, in a free market, my house, which is next to the east, very close to the Easter market, and the neighboring homes would be bought up and apartments put up or possibly condos. We don't have a free market. And again, again 
obviously historic preservation is not consistent with the free market. Uh, no. This would um, opening this up, uh, making the market more free, uh, creating alley dwellings. That's not going to get to the problem of or the issue of low income housing who need enormous subsidies and enormous continuing subsidies. So, I mean, that's and that's that's a tax issue. We have to be willing to pay higher taxes if we want to have more low income housing and or moderate income housing. Are we willing to raise our taxes? You know, that to me is a bottom line question. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I, it made me think about the Apple Store um, in, in Mount Vernon Square. You know, that was the building for the Historic Society. They owned the, the building. They owned the rights to the building. And there was a high enough price from Apple. So they were able to, you know, they're the Historic Society, but the building was modern, modernized, but kept its historic values, the, 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 the or features. The society got a piece of it and the Apple store. It's sort of like when you have these options, there's always a, somebody that will come and figure out how to sort through this transaction problem. The other thing that I wanted to mention is the accessory, accessory dwelling units. The district does have buy right ADUs right now. I think the biggest impediment to ADUs, there are two big impediments to ADUs. Some parts of the city where ADUs can be Build, there is no interest from the residents. They wouldn't want that. They like their yard, they like the pool, you know, it's, um, it, it's, it's not socialized. And I think just working on socializing the idea is really important. I think in parts of the city can, that there would be interest in ADUs, the biggest impediment is how we finance them. We do not finance ADUs. Uh, we don't have any options where we can. Um, we cognize the income generating capacity. We have to finance ADUs like they are bathroom improvements or kitchen improvements. There is no bank loan product right now where the owner of an ADU can either commit the grant from the original unit or the ADU to repayment, which makes financing really difficult. And I think that's one area like, the district government can certainly play a role. All right. Any other questions? Um, in answer to a uh, question, I do have the slides, um, so I can send those out to all participants. Brandon, do you have anything else? I see you thinking about it. Well, I, I don't know what an ADU is. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, a, it's a, sometimes it's called a granny flat. Um, it's basically a second unit built in the yard or in where the garage used to be or something like oh. that. So oh. you're creating a smaller unit on, on, on the same property, yeah, accessory dwelling unit. Okay, okay. So you would know this. So Folger Pratt, who built the safe the apartments among Safeway, do they have to have a certain number of those apartments that are affordable? Are there city rules about that? Yes, every unit that is built, every building that's built up after 2007 must abide by inclusionary zoning. What inclusionary zoning does is create additional height, density, and in return, the owner sets aside a certain number of units under affordability covenant. Okay. The only place that doesn't have ID requirements is the downtown zones, D zones. And the reason they don't have it is there is no density because D zones is, is where you can build whatever you want. You can build office, you can build residential, you can build like, a, you know, anything you want, a hotel, and you can build up to the heights at, so there's nothing to trade. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And so I'm I'm not clear. Does that then mean that there were um, affordable housing units developed above the Safeway? I believe so because because Capitol Hill doesn't have any deep zones. But I want I want to have to go check. I can share with Mary the, the data source that 
tracked every affordable unit created through ID or other means since 2011 or something like this. So you can you can see that database of units. Well, there were, there definitely are affordable housing units connected to the uh, to the sort of swankiest apartments in Capitol Hill, which are at uh, Eastern Market, called the Residences. That's a Bazudo building, and that that actually does have a separate building, which are affordable housing units, a smaller building. So that's why I ask about Folger Pratt. I don't. I've never heard anything about Folger Pratt. Um, I, I'm, I hope they have to have some affordable units in there. I'm pretty sure they do because they, they, this is not the zone. But again, I don't want to be like very prescriptive. It's worth checking. Okay. And, 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 and did you say earlier that um, the Fannie Mae complex that has Wegmans, that, that has affordable housing in it? Totally. What happens is most of these RZ inclusionary um, zoning units stay empty because of the way we place folks in there that, you know, somebody has to certify in the government that the income levels are correct. Landlords don't have the means of checking income levels. They check credit histories and credit histories don't have frequent income reports to them. Um, and so it has to be someone from the government uh, well, it's someone from the government. It's a government office. It's not the most efficient place <laughs> of business. I, and I think I think that there was an effort among landlords to count the number of IT units that are empty, but I, I don't know what number they came up with. Who manages? the affordable units in the new buildings, including screening tenants for income eligibility? Um, DHCD is the one that yeah. does income eligibility. The units are maintained by the landlord office. Yeah. All right, in uh, uh, respecting everyone's time, uh, we're going to draw this to a close, but I want to thank you so much for your time. This has been a really, really informative uh, session. Yes, clap. <laughs> we all appreciate it. Thanks so much and have a good day. Thank you so, so much. I'm so glad that I was able to come and meet with you and thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.